Thank you. So again, we'll do the rest of the questions at the end of the session. Next up, we have Dr. Heron for the right tool for the right job, flexible devices for endoscopy. Thanks so much. I'd like to thanks, uh, thank you for being invited to be a member of this esteemed faculty. I've had the pleasure of uh, speaking at FUSE uh, on many occasions in the past and of helping write the uh, original FUSE textbook, but I've never spoken on the flexible endoscopy chapter before, so I'm a little bit nervous about this. So uh, if my knees are shaking, forgive me. Um, I'd like to thank Brian Duncan, who actually wrote uh, the chapter uh, in the book, and many of the illustrations that we use in this presentation came from Brian Duncan. Um, so, the endoluminal environment is a lot different from working within the general abdominal cavity, but given that, the principles of electrosurgical energy are the same, whether you're inside a piece of bowel or whether you're working in the abdomen or you're working on the outside of the patient. But we do use some specialized tools and some specialized energy sources, and that's why uh, there's a special lecture uh, about flexible endoscopy. Um, I do want to emphasize, and this holds true for everything that you do, it's your responsibility to know your hardware. And the first thing that I always do is when I hand my, my electrosurgical pencil, I didn't call it the Bovi, wasn't that good of me, uh, to, to your resident, you know, I, I, you know, the resident is like, they're moving the, the, the pencil right toward the tissue, they're about to press the button, and I, I asked them, I said, uh, you know what the settings are on the, on the, on the electrosurgical unit, right? And they're like, um, uh, you know, uh, 30, 30, 30, maybe. And they say, well, did you double check that? And so I make them turn around and actually look at the unit to make sure that they know what the setting is before they actually press on the button. And you should do that for yourself too. Uh, and I think it's a really important thing to, even though that's the setting that you may always use, double check it because you may have had a circulating nurse or someone change it to a different value. Um, so how is the environment different? It's a limited space to work. Uh, when you're working in bowel, you've got a roof and two walls. It's like being in a cave, so you've got bowel on every side. Uh, you're usually working with a single hand. Your flexible endoscope uh, or your instrument going through the working channel is your single hand, so you're not working with two hands. And uh, remember, your tool is on the tip of a flexible stalk inside a moving piece of bowel, so you have to be a little bit more careful about the fact that everything is moving around and it's a little more squirmy than it may be in a standard uh, operative field. So when a patient comes in uh, for their endoscopy, uh, it may be to an operating room, maybe you're doing this as part of your operation, but it may be that you're in, a, in an, a, an outpatient endoscopy suite. The patient may not have been seen by a physician before for a good pre-op workup, uh, so you're, it's your responsibility to make sure that the patient is okay for the endoscopy. Uh, you do want to check and make sure that they've had a bowel prep if a bowel prep was indicated. If it was an upper endoscopy, they may have just been NPO or on a clear liquid diet. Uh, but if it was a, a colonoscopy, uh, you want to make sure that they've had a good colon prep. Uh, in the old days when we used mannitol-based preps, you had to be worried about methane buildup in the colon, which is obviously not a good thing if you're using energy. These days we use mostly polyethylene glycol, so it's not as much of an issue. Uh, did the patient have a medical evaluation before they showed up at your outpatient center? Um, and then finally, uh, since we're not shaving their abdomen as we would in an abdominal operation, we don't typically uh, shave the area where a dispersive electrode is placed. So just make sure that you're applying it carefully to a place where it's going to get good contact. And also uh, be aware of the fact that if they're just walking into an outpatient center, they probably still have jewelry on and make sure there are no jewelry or body piercings that are getting in the way of your, uh, of your dispersive electrode. So, like I said, the principles of electrosurgical energy are all the same. Uh, whether you're talking about flexible endoscopy or open surgery, uh, you've got a dispersive electrode, they call it a neutral electrode in this diagram here, and an active electrode. Um, so these are, the, the monopolar devices are probably the most common ones that we use in flexible endoscopy. Uh, you can see here's the, uh, the upper left corner, that's one of the more common ones, a, a, a biopsy forcep, and that can be used either for cold, biopsy, which doesn't use any energy, or with monopolar energy applied to the forceps. Uh, the snare in the upper right corner is probably the most common that we use for taking care of polyps. If you're doing fancy work uh, like POEM or uh, submucosal dissection, uh, you might use a triangular monopolar blade like in the, in the middle of the top row. Um, there's some less common ones uh, that we see down below. There's um, the argon beam at the lower left. 
Uh, there's the Streta device, which is used as an anti-reflux treatment. That's very uncommon these days, but that's also a monopolar device. And then if you do ERCP and you're doing papillotomies, uh, that's a papillotome blade, which is also using uh, monopolar energy. So hot biopsy is very simple. It's just a little clamshell biopsy grasper that you use to uh, grab the, the specimen that you're trying to take. Uh, you like to elevate that. So here you can see that the, the polyp is being stretched away from the base so that, as you can see, the metal parts are not in contact with uh, any other part of the bowel except the bowel that you're biopsying. Uh, and then you can apply a little bit of energy. You see a blanching of the tissue right underneath the biopsy forcep. It looks like a snow-capped mountain, uh, and that's uh, enough hemostasis, and then you can remove the tissue. Now, the problem is if you're truly doing this for a biopsy purpose, you may be causing enough heat that you're going to ruin the specimen that you're pulling out, and so many people will just use this without any energy whatsoever in order to get a cleaner biopsy and then go back and, and uh, take care of any bleeding that may be there. Now, in polypectomy, you're getting a snare around the base of the polyp, uh, and this is a, a, a great way to uh, both uh, hold the polyp and also to apply electrical energy to the base of the polyp. Um, think about that current density diagram that we saw earlier today. Remember, how come you got the same amount of current at your electrosurgical pencil tip as you have on your dispersive electrode on the thigh? Um, so why do you get burnt? Why do you get high temperatures at the tip of the pencil and not on the thigh? Well, because of the current density. It's much higher current density at the tip of your electrocautery, electrosurgery pencil. Excuse me. Um, so same idea with a snare. If you have a lot of tissue inside the snare the current density inside that stalk is going to be lower. So the tighter you pull on that snare, the more current density there is and the more electricity you're applying to the base of that stalk. And you have to be careful with this because often in flexible endoscopy, you might be the person controlling the scope, but someone else is opening and closing the snare for you. So you have to make sure that there's good communication because if the snare gets closed too quickly, it's just going to be like a guillotine and chop off the polyp without applying enough energy. On the other hand, if you spend too much time closing the snare and you close it very slowly and apply too much energy, you're at risk for applying too much burn to the, to the wall of the colon, which can result in a problem. So you want it to be not too much, not too little, just right, so that you get a good combination of that cutting action of the snare, but also with the application of electricity. You have to be careful about direct coupling. And we talked earlier about direct coupling. That's where your electricity is directly being coupled to something else. Sometimes direct coupling is good when you grab a vessel with your with your debakey forceps and you ask your assistant to to buzz your forcep that's intentional direct coupling but you can see since you're working in a closed environment and you've got a roof and two walls a polyp can easily touch one of those walls and result in electricity going to somewhere where it's not desired uh, so there are a couple ways you can do that you can lift up the polyp if it's small and just hold it in the middle of the lumen um, if it's a big polyp like you see in the upper left you may have to kind of wiggle it around or move it as you're buzzing it. So it, it, there may be no way to keep it from touching the other walls of the bowel, but at least if it touches the left side and the top and the right side a little bit, uh, it's not going to cause a burn injury to any one of those areas. So you can either wiggle the polyp around or just elevate it directly up. But if you're elevating it directly up, be careful that you don't run into the situation in the lower right corner where the top of the polyp is touching the roof. Um, so elevate it. Uh, you can elevate it by just pulling the polyp away from the wall. You can also use a submucosal injection. Here you can see uh, a lesion is elevated with methylene blue to get it away from the wall so you can avoid those issues with direct coupling. Now, what kind of current should you use when you're using a snare? Um, well, your choices are what? Cut, coag, or blend? Uh, and as we remember, blend is not a blending of cut and coag, but it's, it's kind of like a reduced version of coag. So it's an interrupted uh, AC current with uh, higher voltage than pure cut, but lower voltage than with coag. And usually the recommendation is that if you're using a snare, you should use blend or coag. But if you use pure cut, you're going to have a higher incidence of bleeding from the stalk of the polyp uh, after uh, you're done. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a, a fancy electrical energy source like an Irby, and Irby is a, 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 a company which makes a 
specific um, electrosurgical energy box, uh, which has a, a very special mode, which is a combination of cutting and coagulation, which automatically goes back and forth. Uh, this is how the, the waveform changes over time. Uh, it's a very nice way to uh, apply energy. Uh, here, it's, it's often used for um, papillotomy. Here you can see it being used for a, a papillotomy device. Um, but you can also use it just for standard polyps as well, if you do have that available. Um, Post-polypectomy syndrome is something which occurs either due to a small microperforation from removal of a polyp or a thermal injury that goes all the way transmurally across the colon. Uh, and this is where a patient does looks okay after you finish up your polypectomy, but they develop severe abdominal pain after they get home a few hours later. This usually responds to non-operative treatment. So you don't if a, if a patient comes back and they've got new onset of abdominal pain several hours after their uh, polypectomy during a, a colonoscopy. Uh, maybe you did a scan or an x-ray and there's no obvious free air, so it's not a big frank perforation, but they're behaving as if they have a small microperforation. That's post-polypectomy syndrome, and it usually resolves on its own with uh, some uh, antibiotics and some observation. So GI bleeding uh, is another big time uh, where we're using electrosurgical energy in the endoscopic realm, uh, we can treat GI bleeding both with and without electrosurgical energy. So certainly we can use a sclerotherapy needle and we can inject a sclerosing agent or we can uh, inject a vasoconstricting uh, medication. This is the one time in this whole day where I'm allowed to say cautery, so I'm very excited. Uh, th this actually is a cautery device here. Remember what we talked about, cautery is when you apply something hot to tissues. It's like when you touch a match to your finger or when you pull a red hot poker out of the fire because it's the 14th century and that's all you have to stop bleeding. Uh, but this is a heater probe. Um, this uh, has an energy setting. Uh, here it's set to 30 joules. Uh, and it also has a water squirter. So it's a little probe that has a little uh, heat, uh, it does heat up at the tip and it allows you to squirt water on the tissues at well, as well. Uh, and this has to be used a little bit differently. This is a device which has to be pushed against the tissues so that you can directly transfer the heat from the heater probe to the tissues and then you can use the water uh, to rinse off the blood and make sure that the bleeding has stopped. Uh, and as you can see, they usually come with a little foot pedal that has one button for uh, heating and one for washing. So this is the first and last time you're going to see cautery used uh, in this course. Actually, if you've ever been in the emergency room and you've had a little battery-powered cautery unit, that also is true cautery. It looks like a little soldering iron or a little pencil, but those things which are not connected to the wall but they run on a couple of batteries and you can use for stopping bleeding in the emergency room, that's also true cautery. So that and this are the only times you'll ever see the word cautery used correctly. What about bipolar energy? Can we use this uh, endoscopically? Yes, you can. Uh, there's this, uh, you can either call it the multipolar electrocoagulation probe or the MPEC. Uh, it has these little gold wires wrapped around in a spiral. Um, there's actually two little spirals. Uh, so this is a bipolar instrument. And so this is used for uh, what's called coaptive hemostasis. It's a fancy way of saying you squeeze the vessel with the device and you apply the energy. And here the energy is going directly from one of the gold coils to an adjacent gold coil. So it's not going through the patient to a dispersive electrode on their leg. It's just being used entirely within. So it's a, a very safe method of applying electrical energy to the tissues. But again, you need to compress the tissues when you're using this device. Um, Argon plasma coagulation is terrific uh, when used endoscopically because it's a, a very shallow depth of penetration. Uh, and um, it can be very effective if you're treating a big raw surface um, and you need to send a lot of energy to the tissues without being too concerned about uh, very deep penetration of the energy. But what do you have to remember? Remember with argon beam, the argon beam works by squirting out a stream of argon gas from the tip of the instrument. And that's good for two reasons. Number one, we heard that argon is one of those gases that supports a lot of electrons, so you can have a long shaft of sparks versus uh, an electrosurgical pencil where it doesn't spark over much distance. So an argon beam can send sparks over a much longer distance because of the argon. And the argon flow also pushes all the fluid or the blood out of your way. So if you have a bleeding area and you use the argon beam, uh, it pushes the blood out of the way. It's a very nice device, but remember, it injects a lot of argon gas. So if you stick the tip 
of an argon probe right into the wall of bowel, it's going to inject argon gas in the wall of bowel, and you're going to end up with pneumatosis. So don't be surprised if you saw that after pushing uh, your instrument into, into the wall of bowel. Similarly, if you're, you're working in a closed space, so be sure after you use a little bit of argon beam coagulation that you suck out the argon. Otherwise, you're going to end up with very distended bowel that looks something like this. So definitely suck it, use argon beam a little bit, suck out the argon, and then use it again. And this is true whether you're using it in the bowel or uh, in a laparoscopic setting. You don't have to worry about it in open surgery, of course. Uh, finally, it's worth mentioning a couple of special devices. Uh, this is the Barracks device that was owned by the Barracks company for a while, and then it was uh, acquired by Medtronic. Um, it's a uh, special device which allows a very controlled um, bipolar ablation. Uh, it's basically a computerized bipolar system which allows very controlled, very thin level of bipolar tissue ablation. It's used for uh, ablating tissue within the esophagus, uh, like in uh, Barrett's esophagus. Uh, and if you see, this is, this is a probe which is placed inside a bath of saline, so you can see how it causes uh, heating over just a very thin area to immediately adjacent to the probe. And you can see it's activated first distally and then in the mid-portion and then proximally. Um, this is what uh, esophageal tissue looks like after it's been ablated um, by the, the barrack system. And then finally, we mentioned the Streta device. Streta was, uh, I think it came out in the, in the early 2000s, and it was uh, a non-surgical means of treating reflux, uh, the idea being that you could place one of these Streta devices, uh, and as you can see, it's got a balloon catheter. Uh, the balloon has uh, some little metal spikes on it, and this could be placed in the lower esophagus and used to apply heat, uh, or radio frequency energy, to heat the tissues in the lower esophagus to cause some contraction of the connective tissues there and enhance the lower esophageal sphincter. It's a very controversial device. Some people think it doesn't work. Some people think it does. Uh, but again, this is just a monopolar device, not very commonly used. So to summarize, an endoscopic electrosurgical energy is all the same. It's just in a different place uh, with different tools and special energy sources. Thank you. <laughs>